In this video, we're going to look at the first major topic in thermodynamics, which is we're going to look at the first law of thermodynamics and we're going to look at energy. So thermodynamics are more commonly known in chemistry as thermal chemistry, uh, and these terms can be used synonymously. Um, thermodynamics is a broader term. Thermal chemistry is thermodynamics applied to chemistry. So thermal chemistry is the study of heat absorbed or released by a reaction. And we can apply our, we have to apply the rules of thermodynamics to thermochemistry. So when we're studying chemistry, we have to follow the rules of thermodynamics. So the first law of thermodynamics says that, um, it, the first law of thermodynamics is the law of conservation of energy. And it says that you can convert energy from one form to another, but it can't be created or destroyed. So throughout this entire chapter, we're going to be looking at how energy is, is transferred from one form to another. Primarily, we're going to be looking about how chemical energy or the energy stored inside of a molecule is converted to heat and vice versa. Now that we know what the first law of thermodynamics is, we, can, we have to talk about what energy is. And if you go back to a bit your basic physics class, uh, energy is defined as the potential or capacity to move matter. And it gets units of joules. Now a joule is a calculated unit that has units of kilograms meters squared per second squared. So that's built into the joule. And there are a couple of different types. There is kinetic energy. Well, there's, there's more, even more than what we're gonna cover, but these are the main ones. Kinetic energy, which is the energy of motion. And this gets, um, the equation for this is equal to one half mv squared. We actually saw this in the last, um, chapter uh, when we looked at the energy of gas molecules in motion. So that's kinetic energy and this depends on the mass of an object and its velocity. We have potential energy and this depends on position. So depending on what type of potential energy you're talking about, you could have a potential energy that's related to um, height above the ground. So that's the potential energy in a gravity field. That would be equal to uh, mgh, where g is the gravitational constant and h is the height. Uh, you could have electrical energy, which would be the location of a charge in an electrical field. And so, and then the last one, and this is the one that we're gonna be most interested in, is what we call internal energy. And probably this is one that you wouldn't have talked about in high school. So this is specifically related to chemistry because this is the energy that is stored inside of a material. And when we say inside of a material, it is really the energy that's stored as the sum of the kinetic and potential energy of the individual particles. So Internal energy is the basically the sum of the kinetic energy plus the potential energy of the individual atoms, molecules, and whatever else makes up the material. Now, a lot of times you can sort of, by shorthand, summarize this as bonds, electrochemical uh, chemical bonds. Um, oftentimes when you have a reaction, you can think of a reaction in terms of the making and breaking of bonds and typically internal energy kind of gets summarized into that but actually believe it or not internal energy can also be involved in in cases where you don't really make or break bonds like for example when you evaporate water it's true that you are making or breaking intermolecular interactions but in that case you're not really breaking chemical bonds so it is the sum of the kinetic and potential energy of the individual particles so if we had to write an equation the total energy of a material would be its kinetic energy plus its potential energy plus its internal energy. And U gets this, mu is the symbol for internal energy. So now let's think about a reaction in a laboratory. So if you're running a reaction, if this is your laboratory bench and you've got your test tube sitting on the, the laboratory bench and this is where your reaction is taking place. Well, normally the kinetic energy of this test tube is going to be zero. So the change in kinetic energy is going to be zero. So when you, you guys have done some experiments at home, when you do your experiment, uh, like for example, when you react vinegar with um, baking soda and you have that test tube sitting there, it's kinetic energy, the test tube is not moving. So there's no change in the kinetic energy. And the same thing is true with the potential energy. 
So the change in the potential energy is also zero. At the end of the reaction, the test tube is still in the same spot as to where it started. But the energy change that is taking place is related entirely to the U. So the energy of a reaction is related to the change in the internal energy. The last thing we're going to talk about in this video is now that we understand that the change in the energy of a reaction is related to the change in the internal energy, the question is, is where is that internal energy going? So when we have delta U, can we assign that delta U to some physical parameters that might be changing? So what, what's coming out of this reaction or going into it? Well, there are two things. There's what we call Q and there's what we call W. So Q is heat and W is work. So take, for example, like an internal combustion engine in a car. Um, an internal combustion engine is the perfect ex example for this. You take gasoline, which is octane, you add oxygen, and you make carbon dioxide and water. And we all know that when your car runs for a while, it gets hot. So we make some heat. But the other thing that we make is work, because our car goes from one place to another. So the reaction in this case is giving off energy in two forms. It's giving off heat and it's giving off energy that's used for work. Now, in terms of heat, we're going to talk about heat. At the, that's going to be the bulk of this chapter is the heat that's given off or, or taken in. But in certain cases, we can also look at, at work. Now, for work, there is a specific type of work that applies to an internal combustion engine. And it's pretty ubiquitous in chemistry. And this is what we call P delta V work. So work is equal to minus P delta V. And what, what do I mean by P delta V work? Well, when you have an internal combustion engine, you have a cylinder and a piston. And what's happening is, is you have a little, ex you have a little bit of fuel that goes in, into your combustion, into your, into your reaction chamber. And that fuel reacts with air and it makes an explosion. And what happens is that explosion pushes the piston up and out. So you're, after the explosion, your piston goes from one position to another. So you, you basically have increased the volume. So at a given pressure, you have changed the volume inside your cylinder. And that is how the car actually operates. That mechanical change in the volume of the, of, the pis, of the cylinder and the movement of the piston turns a crankshaft, which then turns the wheels. So this is why we say this is P delta V work. So rea in reality, what we have is we have delta U is equal to the heat that's, that's transferred plus, or I, I should actually say not plus because it's minus, minus P delta V. And the reason why we put the minus there is because it's directional. So the reaction, when it does work, it's losing energy. So we have to put that minus sign there to make sure that we account for the direction in which the energy is flowing. So we have heat and we have work. Now, in general, in chemistry, the work we're not so concerned about. We tend to focus on the heat. So in the next video, we're going to look at heat and heat transfer.